Dear friends, dear Dr. Kim, and of course, Dr. Beaton, it is my pleasure to be joining you again today for the third event in the series, uh, Feelings Through the Ages. It has been an enlightening series thus far that has shed light on this fascinating and unique phenomenon we call philalinism, which played a, def a definitive role in the Greek War of Independence and an important role of the, over the last 200 years in Greece's modern trajectory. As many of you know, this year Greece celebrates the 200th anniversary of the Greek Revolution, which began in 1821 and ended in 1830 with the creation of the modern Greek state. It is heartwarming for us that this anniversary is celebrated in so many cities around the United States and, as a matter of fact, around the world. These celebrations attest that the spirit of philalinism is alive and well. It, they attest also to the fact that the Greek diaspora has managed to instill the love for Greece into the societies where they live. It also attests to the fact that the Greek culture, the Greek ideals, are part of today's world. I'm especially thrilled about today's event on philalinism and Greek independence with Dr. Roderick Britton. I have followed Mr. Dr. Beaton's work for years, uh, and I have had the pleasure of hearing him speak. Uh, Dr. Beaton, thank you so much for graciously accepting Dr. Kim's invitation, and I eagerly look forward to the discussion. As I said, I always find uh, what you say quite interesting, and your books are wonderful, they're amazing, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, Dr. Kim, congratulations to you and the University of Illinois in Chicago on the success of this uh, series on philalinism and helping Greeks like myself uh, get a more comprehensive understanding of the philalenic movement by being outside Greece. We have a different perception when we live in Greece uh, and we get a different perception when we move out of Greece. Uh. I would also like to recognize those who helped make this series a reality, including His Eminence Metropolitan Nathaniel of Chicago, Mr. Andy Zemenidis of the Hellenic American Leadership Council, and Mrs. Ekaterini Dimakis, Consul General of Greece in Chicago. Thank you all, the viewers, who are taking the time from your busy schedules to join us and be enlightened along with us. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, for your inspiring and warm opening remarks. Greetings to everyone joining us today. Kalispera se olos tus filos mas. My name is young Richard Kim, and I am an associate professor in the Department of Classics and Mediterranean Studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Our program is presented under the auspices of the Embassy of Greece in the United States and is a result of a fruitful partnership among the Hellenic American Leadership Council the Classics and Mediterranean Studies Department at the University of Illinois, Chicago, the Greek Orthodox Metropolitan of Chicago, the Consul General of Greece in Chicago, and the Foundation for Hellenic Studies, Illinois. I'd like to extend my sincerest greetings and thanks to our partners, including to you, Madam Ambassador, and also to the Cultural Attaché for the Embassy of Greece in the United States, Kani Murtupalas, as well as other embassy staff, His Eminence, Metropolitan Nathanael of Chicago, and His Eminides, Ex Executive Director of HALC, the Consul General of Chicago, Ekaterina Dimakis, and other members of the Consular Corps, Chancellor Michael Aymaridis and other uh, colleagues at UIC, and the members of the Board of the Foundation for Hellenic Studies Illinois. Today's conversation is the third of our Phil Hellenism Through the Age series, in celebration of the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution. Building on our two conversations about ancient and medieval Philhellenism, we continue our exploration of the persistence and perseverance of Greek culture and its manifold expressions in the lead up to and during the revolution and its aftermath. I invite you members of the audience to join in the conversation by posting questions in the comment section of the Facebook live feed, and we will have a time at the end of our conversation to ask uh, some of those questions. It is my honor to introduce my guest and conversation partner, Dr. Roderick Beaton, who is the Emeritus Quarais Professor of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language and Literature at King's College London. Over a distinguished and productive career, Professor Beaton has written extensively on all manner of subjects related to Greece, including his magisterial study, Greece, Biography of a Modern Nation, published in 2019. Dr. Beaton, welcome and thank you for joining us today. 
Well, it's a very great pleasure to be uh, with you. And thank you, uh, Professor Kim, most uh, warmly for the invitation to join you. And uh, may I thank also um, the Ambassador, Mrs. Papadopoulou, for her very kind words of uh, introduction earlier. It's a great uh, uh, privilege for me, and it's also a somewhat new experience. So I'm looking forward to it and uh, joining, as you say, the conversation. Thank you. Wonderful. So in our um, previous two conversations in the series, um, we've been exploring uh, sort of Philhellenism from antiquity through the Byzantine period um, until the fall of Constantinople in 1453. And so as we pick up from that point in history, I thought I would just begin by asking you to reflect a little bit um, on the ways that Greek culture was able to survive and perhaps even flourish during the period of Ottoman occupation. Sure. I mean, it very much did. And um, <clears throat> had it not, of course, there would hardly have been any question of uh, Greek independence in modern times. But the period that, we're, that um, you're ushering in at this point, at this point of the is um, it's a kind of interim period or, or almost an obscure period because it's um, a property of all the periods in Greek history. It's the one where the Greeks have perhaps fewest friends outside their own communities. Uh, they are they are all after the fall of Constantinople, ruled either by Western, usually Roman Catholic um, princes or principalities, or increasingly and in, in the end almost exclusively by the Islamic Empire of the Ottoman Turks. So, um, most. I mean, I tend to avoid what I regard as, uh, forgive me, as a slight cliche of the, you know, the sort of 400 years of slavery, because the position of Greece, of Greeks under these various jurisdictions um, is more complicated than that. Um, some Greeks were subject to the Ottomans for anything between 150 and 600 years, um, and for quite a long period um, within the later Middle Ages. Uh, very many Greeks were actually subject to Venice or to French-speaking crusaders or Genoese or other you know, Europeans who are adventuring in the Eastern Mediterranean. So it's a, it's, a very, it's a very complex, it's a shifting picture. But the remarkable thing from the point of view of the, <clears throat> of the, Greek, of the Greek story is that during those hundreds of years, uh, after the, including both before and after the fall of Constantinople, there is a very strong persistence, main, main, uh, maintained continuity, both of the Greek language and of the Greek Orthodox Church. And the, these are the these. I mean, it's very well known and it's often repeated that you know, those are the, um, the those are the threads of continuity which really. Uh, gave Greek people a sense of community and a sense of identity while, <clears throat> while they were ruled over by others with whom you know, they had often rather little in common. But, I mean, there's two sides to this because, again, which is why I sort of hesitate <clears throat> to, you know, I hesitate to use the term slavery because, I mean, I find it very instructive to compare what happened after the fall of Constantinople with what happened at just the same time, very little bit later, the end of the 15th century, in the Iberian Peninsula. Because the Christian reconquest of Spain and Portugal from the Muslims was followed by a complete obliteration of all religions other than Roman Catholicism, and indeed the expulsion and uh, of the expulsion of populations, famously the Jews were expelled from Spain and Portugal in 1492, and the Inquisition made sure that even, even Muslims who had converted to Catholicism weren't allowed ever to return to their original faith. Nothing like that happened in the Ottoman Empire. It was run on a very, a very different lines. The Ottomans um, actually in a, you might say a cynical, but certainly quite a real, realistic political kind of sense, made a point of incorporating, right at the very beginning, incorporating the highest echelons of the Orthodox Church into their own state apparatus. And they then, in many ways, actually rebuilt the Byzantine Empire, which had really fallen apart under its you know, under its own weight for several centuries before 1453, they reconstituted the power of Istanbul, Constantinople as a world 
city, the capital of the world empire, which still had a very large Greek Orthodox population, and they embraced the Orthodox uh, uh, hierarchy as a means of maintaining that empire. So, you know, it could have been a situation of complete persecution, annihilation, and, you know, mercifully, the Greeks were spared that, and they made every possible use of the opportunities that they had. It's a fascinating and complex picture that you paint then of what um, uh, the reality was for the Greeks on, um, during the, the period of the Ottomans. Um, so, so I'd like to sort of follow up on the, some of the comments that you made, in particular with respect to the language then. So were, uh, was the Greek language, uh, obviously it was continued to be spoken, but do we see patterns of greater bilingualism? Um, did Greek language uh, remain an aspect of a distinct identity vis-a-vis -vis the, the relationship with the larger Ottoman state? Absolutely. I mean, the key really was that it was the, I mean, Greek was the language of the Byzantine state that the Ottomans had systematically conquered for the previous 150 years. So they were used, you know, they were used to dealing with people whose language was Greek. Um, it was the principle, it was all not quite, but almost the only written language of the Orthodox population. Um, I mean, in Russia, beyond the ends of the empire, there was um, obviously Russian was written by this time. Uh, Serbian and Bulgarian were written languages going back to the um, 10th century, I think. But the, you know, the official written language, both of the state and of the church, was Greek, the kind of formal Greek that I'm sure you were talking about with Antony Kaldelis in your uh, in your last uh, discussion. Um, and it was you know, it, it was, again, the Ottomans didn't have to play it this way, but they did. And in fact, I mean, it's said that Mehmed the Conqueror himself was, was spoke Greek well. Um, he did go to considerable efforts to, re to repopulate his, his capital city with Greek speakers, Greek Orthodox. Um, so that for, for some time, the, the language of certain kinds of administration, and certainly always the language of the church hierarchy, the actual administration of the church, which was left largely untouched by the Ottomans, all of that was Greek. And that meant that not just people who we might think of as ethnic Greeks spoke and wrote in Greek, but actually all the Orthodox Christians within the Ottoman Empire, at least in the European and Anatolian provinces, they all functioned in Greek and they all learned to write this semi-formal kind of Greek. So you've got a kind of, you've got Greek as a kind of unofficial second language of the rayas, of the, the room, as the Ottomans called the, um, the Orthodox population. Because remember, the Orthodox, um, the, the, um, the Ottomans famously had no interest in people's sort of tribal or ethnic identity at all. They divided up populations purely on grounds of religion. So in Ottoman Turkish, the word room, which of course comes from Romeos, the Byzantine term they use for themselves, means not a Byzantine anymore, but an Orthodox Christian. And from the Turkish point of view, Ottoman point of view, it could be, they could be Bulgarians or Albanians or um, Romanians, Vlachs, and not all of these languages were even written. So Greek is the language of education right from the very, very beginning. And schools are set up by the Orthodox Church um, within a year of the conquest, and it would maintain the old Byzantine system of education. That goes right through to what we call the Greek Enlightenment, which mm -hmm. saw a great burgeoning of new school foundations during the 18th century, and in hindsight, is often said to have laid the foundations for the Greek Revolution of 1821. Mm. Well, yeah, that's, a, that's again, very interesting. May I, may I ask you then about this comment that you made about sort of how the Ottoman state um, utilized or took advantage of the sort of upper echelons of the Greek speaking community. And there were, you know, the, the sort of administrators, the, the so-called fanariots as, uh, as a part of this system. Um, what role would you say that these type of men, large by and large, um, played in the preservation and, and perhaps even the, the flourishing of Greek culture in this period? Yeah, I mean, it, it varied. The fanariots are a phenomenon that really begins at the end of the 
17th century and really takes off during the 18th century. But even before that, I mean, there's always been an upper echelon of um, <clears throat> former Byzantine families who maintain their connections to the church. They're, they're, they take advantage of, um, I mean, the Greeks have always been great traders. And the Ottomans actually, um, not perhaps by design, but by their policies, enabled them to become great traders once again. Because by the end of the Byzantine period, um, the seaborne trade in the Eastern Mediterranean was all in the hands of Italians, Venetians and Genoese. And the Byzantines latterly had actually given away great privileges so that, you know, the, the Byzantine navy kind of faded away um, and uh, the... And it was no longer Greek run ships that were carrying grain to and from the Black Sea, for example. But the Ottomans always saw the enemy as being the Western Europeans. So they were always determined to shut out, shut out the Roman Catholics. So that's the end of Venice. That's the end of Genoa in areas that the Ottomans control. And the Greeks come rushing back in. And apparently by the, you know, by about, by about 1600, um, you know, the Greeks make up about a third of the population of Istanbul, Constantinople, and they're already, um, it's Greek ship captains, ship owners, who are actually carrying by much the lion's share of Ottoman trade um, through the Black Sea and through the Mediterranean with Western Europe. And through trade, um, Greeks, Greek speakers, Orthodox Christians are getting wealthy. And as they become wealthy, <clears throat> there are various positions open to them in the Orthodox Church. But the Ottoman Empire itself began to change in the late 17th century. And the pivotal moment is 1683, because that's when the Ottomans lay siege to Vienna for the second time. And they're beaten back from the walls of Vienna. It's a close run thing. But after that, the Ottoman Empire is always militarily on the back foot. From 1683 onwards, there are no more Ottoman conquests. The Ottoman Empire begins to consolidate. And very quickly after that, the, the Sultan and the ruling class begin to realize the importance of international relations. In, they stop basically fighting wars with Western Europeans. Instead, they, need to, they start and need to talk to them. How do they do that? They need people who can who can manage with the languages. Who can manage with the languages? You guessed it, the Greeks. Mm. And some of those Greeks have been trading all over the Western Mediterranean. They've got, you know, they can speak half a dozen modern languages, several ancient ones. And of course, they're fluent in Ottoman Turkish as well. So the Ottoman hierarchy seizes upon these highly intelligent, highly educated, highly mobile Greek elites. And invites them, sort of teases them to compete, sometimes often stab each other in the back, for very important privileges within the Ottoman state. So that now it's not just the, the Orthodox Church that is uh, an important pillar of the Ottoman state. It's this newly emerging class, which comes to be called Fanarios, <clears throat> of the Fanari district of Istanbul, where the Orthodox uh, Ecumenical Patriarchate was housed. But this really began with the need for interpreters, and the first fanariots were, had the title of Great Dragoman, which in Ottoman Turkish apparently means an interpreter. These were, these were diplomats. Mm -hmm. And for 100 years after that, Ottoman diplomacy with Western Europe was in the hands of Greek speakers. And latterly, actually no, for much of the 18th century, the Ottomans also devolved the administration of the the provinces that reached furthest into Europe, Wallachia and Moldavia in today's Romania, also known as the Danubian principalities, they devolved the administration of these whole provinces to the Fanario class, which mm -hmm. they really took off, spread, became more numerous, more influential, richer, and also um, more, high, you know, more highly educated. So, and some of that education trickled down to Greek communities more widely as well. Yeah, so I, I wonder because the Fenaria to sort of class, let's say, you know, represents this upper echelon that worked, you know, um, at the behest of the Ottoman state. But of course, there's a significant population and, and layers of the communities 
um, that were less well to do and less well off. And, and, and I imagine many of them lived in quite difficult circumstances and suffered. Uh, and so I wonder to what extent then the, that the sort of lower strata of the Greek communities, did they look upon the phanariots and these elites as uh, representing their community and interests or um, perhaps uh, at ends, uh, opposite ends of, uh, of the community? Or uh, I'm, I'm sure it's a complicated picture, but I wonder if you could reflect on that a little bit. Sure. I mean, it's again, I mean, it is, it is a complicated picture because, you know, there's something between three and five million Orthodox Greek speakers and smaller numbers of Greek speakers who are actually not Orthodox. I mean, there are, for example, there are there are Greek there are Greek speaking communities that still are in the Cyclade, in the islands of the Aegean, who are Roman Catholics. Um, and uh, there was larger than it is today, but uh, a, a, a long established community of Romaniot Jews, that is Jews whose first language, whose spoken language is uh, is Greek. Um, but I mean, to simplify the picture, let's say that you know. A, it's not quite true that all Greeks are Orthodox, but the great majority of them are. And these people are scattered right across, um, you know, it's a rural community, very small, usually very poor, um, starting from the Ionian Islands in the West, which at this time were still ruled by Venice in the 18th century, <clears throat> right round, round both sides of the Aegean, through the Balkans, into several large enclaves in Anatolia, in today's Turkey, and then at the in the second in the well, the last third of the 18th century, more than a million of these people were actually attracted from the Ottoman Empire to the lands north of the Black Sea that Russia had recently conquered from the Ottomans and populated with Orthodox people, Orthodox immigrants from the Ottoman Empire who were overwhelmingly Greek speaking. So across all these communities, you've got very different levels of, um, you know, of education, of background. I mean, most people are living in poverty, most are illiterate. And a lot of these people will have very little idea of a sense of community with, you know, if you're living in the Ionian, Ionian Islands, what do you know about someone living in, in a village in the mountains above Trebizond, you know, more than a thousand miles away? And the you know, communications aren't very good either. Um, so it's a, it's a very fragmented society, but it's but it's also... Um, you know, it's it's widely it's widely scattered. There's no single place you could call a Greek heartland. There's nowhere, um, probably any in the world, where everybody speaks Greek. But there are quite a lot of places where Greeks are in the majority, <clears throat> or you know, they're a very sizable minority. So you know, they're they are they are a community. Um, so yes, what do you think of the Phanariots? Well. Um, are they even aware of them at all? At some levels, possibly not. And I mean, I you know, I've been, I've so far, I'm conscious of this. I mean, I've been talking up the what you might call the upsides of the of Ottoman rule. That you know, it wasn't all as dark and as horrible as um, it's sometimes presented as being. I mean, elites benefiting, but the great majority, um, it's very unlikely that they did. And um, at the opposite end of the spectrum from the Phanariots and the highest echelons of the church, who are actually doing quite well in the Ottoman system, there are, uh, I mean, several hundreds of people who are still commemorated in the Orthodox Church as what are called neo-martyrs. That is, people who were, for one reason or another, um, martyred for their faith during the Ottoman period. Um, <clears throat> This is nothing like the, um, you know, again, I mean, I think the comparison with Muslims and Jews in Spain is instructive, but, you know, we should not forget those. And there certainly were situations in which Ottoman rule could be, um, you know, by modern standards, sort of grotesquely um, brutal and, uh, and cruel. But I think, I mean, to answer your question, I think perhaps the, I mean, I would, what I would, as well as that diversity, I would also want to stress that the education supported by the church, or promoted by the church, and funded by the merchants and the fanarios, is reaching down through Greek society. And there is indeed a, a deliberate policy on the part of the Ottoman church to encourage people to become educated and to achieve the means of earning a living as Orthodox Christians as a bulwark against Islamization. At the opposite end of that spectrum, 
that generates an, an upward social movement. It's not huge, but it's very widespread, whereby the children of even the poorest families can go to a church school, they can get the benefit of an education, and with education comes a chance of getting on a foot on the ladder that leads to prosperity, which might make you a ship's captain, uh, you know, yeah. sailing to the Western Mediterranean, getting rich, or it might get you a position in the Ottoman hierarchy. Um, so there is that, um, you know, education is perhaps the lubrication of a process of upward mobility um, that it pre even tenuously links these scattered, isolated, often very poor communities living on subsistence with the uh, the really wealthy and the really powerful, well-connected Fanarians. You describe very uh, well this complex picture of what's happening with the Greek community within the Ottoman Empire. But of course, as we enter into the latter centuries, um, changes are afoot in, uh, in places beyond. And so you mentioned earlier this uh, concept of this idea of the Greek Enlightenment um, that seems to be um, developing in the uh, 18th century. So I wonder if you could tell us um, what were its roots, um, who were its most important voices, and what ideals were they, they promoting and that, are, that comprise this uh, Greek um, Enlightenment? Sure. I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a phenomenon. That, I mean, it, it was, it was sort of rather neglected for a long time, and um, it was, <clears throat> it was really rediscovered um, by the uh, great scholar um, Krasnodinos Bimaras, who actually first, I think, coined the term in the late 1940s, um, and uh, you know, he did did pioneering work on that, and that mantle has been taken on more recently by Pascal Kitomelidis, who I'm sure you, whose work I'm sure you, you know, many of the viewers will know. And uh, Pascal has got a wonderful recent book um, on um, you know on the on the Greek Enlightenment, published by Harvard University Press, which I very much recommend to anyone interested in this uh, in this phenomenon. But I mean, in a few words, I mean, the Greek Enlightenment is a modern term for this burgeoning of education and process of science, scientific and philosophical inquiry, publication that went hand in, you know, went hand in hand with it during the 18th century, just into the 19th, and very much in uh, contemporaneously with, and in, to some extent, in and very and indeed in dialogue with the uh, European Enlightenment. Um, which is, you know, main, mainly um, associated with uh, thinkers who wrote in uh, French, French, German, and to some extent English. So you got the, you know, you got the European Enlightenment, which is really rediscovering the classical, <clears throat> the classical and secular roots of European civilization, and promoting very much a secular agenda. And the, <clears throat> you've got the parallel Greek Enlightenment, which is vigorously um, sort of tunneling into the achievements of the European Enlightenment. A lot of uh, publications are being translated into Greek and circulated uh, in pub in book form through the Ottoman Empire, and they're being read in these uh, in these schools. But there's also a fundamental difference because the Greek Enlightenment, perhaps with uh, in, in uh, you know in scare quotes, um, is um, it, it's it is fundamentally um, a movement sponsored at the beginning by the church. And whereas the, you know, particularly in France, the Enlightenment really sort of rubs up against the Catholic Church, and when it all bursts in, out in violence in the French Revolution, it's you know Catholicism and Catholic priests, you know, go to the guillotine, and um, you know the Christianity is even abolished for the time in the Greek in the French Revolution. In Greece, um, there's much, there's almost no anti-clericalism in the Enlightenment because actually it's church. You know, there is no state. It's church and educators going hand in hand. And in that sense, I mean, the Greek Enlightenment is also, it does lag some way behind the European in the kind of, I mean, Professor Kito Williams might hate me for saying this, but you know, I, I don't get the sense that they're really, they're not making breakthroughs in science. They're not challenging the, um, the you know, sort of teaching of the Orthodox Church. Um, 
I mean, you asked me who the great figures are. Um, I mean, one was um, Evgenios Vulgais, who was born in Corfu and ended up at the age of 90, having been ordained a bishop at the court of St. Catherine, of, Saint, of uh, uh, the Empress Catherine the Great of Russia in St. Petersburg. Um, another, um, Nikiforos Theotokis, again, came from Corfu, benefited from the Italian education, but was orthodox. Um, uh, had a very varied career, travelled to southern Russia. Um, and I think again he ended up a, ended up a bishop in today's Ukraine. Um, but I mean, Theodore is quite an interesting example because it's something I think it's in a book of, as late as 1764. He for the first time accepts, but in a slightly roundabout way, the idea that maybe the Earth goes round the sun and not the sun around the Earth. But he's a bit careful how he puts it. And this is a man who ended his life in holy orders. So, you know, this is not Voltaire, it's not Rousseau. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, I think, I mean, as I put it once, I mean, I think the most fascinating lesson that the Greek enlighteners learned from their scientific inquiry was actually to discover themselves. They discovered what Western Europeans and was Russians too were thinking and writing about ancient Greeks, mm. and they began to. They were the ones who began to think. Well, hang on. If the Westerners, if the Westerners see us as the descendants of Pericles and uh, you know Leonidas of Sparta and all these great people who are the founders of Western civilization, kind of, you know, where are we in this picture? And the way in which the education system sponsored by the Orthodox Church sprung from Byzantium as it was, had been thinking about those things, was actually rather different. So it's really, it's the, the Greek enlightenment becomes the channel by which Western ideas about Greece and Greek history become, begin to become known by Greeks themselves. And actually, I think it's, I mean, I would argue they don't become mainstream among most Greeks until after 1821, after the revolution. So you paint a really fascinating picture then of almost parallel enlightenments in process. There is a continental European enlightenment, of course, that, that we are well familiar with. Uh, and, and those intellectuals are deeply interested in the ancient Greek tradition uh, and and sort of the values and, uh, and and philosophical ideas that were rooted in this ancient past. Whereas there's also a kind of parallel enlightenment happening uh, among the Greek intellectuals within who are living under the Ottoman period. And for the for those Greek intellectuals, there is not this uh, sense of conflict or. Uh, ideological difference with Christianity, whereas in the European one, there is a, a deeper sense of this. And so my question for you then is, did the intellectuals uh, in the European Enlightenment, when they thought of the Greek communities, I suppose if they thought of them at all, living in the Ottoman world, did they perceive them to be the kind of inheritors of that ancient Greek tradition which they so very much admired? Or was there a perception of a gap or a discontinuity that uh, those who are in uh, the Greek-speaking communities would not have thought of in that way? Well, I mean, both. Um, and, I mean, quite interesting point, because on the one hand, um, I mean, the European Enlighteners are the very ones who are there realizing the <clears throat> civilization of ancient Greece as something which, you know, transcends, but also is the inspiration for what they're trying to create themselves in their own in their own time. Um, and I mean, none of those major figures of the Western Enlightenment ever went to Greece or experienced um, or met Greeks um, face to face. But um, to the extent that they read about them from travelers who had, it's pretty universal to say that, you know, the modern Greeks are nothing like the ancient. And this is this is really the beginning. I mean, David Hume has some particularly sort of uh, offhand remark about how debased the modern Greeks are by comparison with the with the ancients. And, and this becomes a kind of cliche in both in, for Western travelers and then the um, and others who read these travels. But 
you know, Greece uh, under Ottoman, under Turkish rule, you know, has become debased. The people have become debased. Um, uh, you know, Lord Byron uses the term willing bondsman, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the foreigners can't understand how it is that these people seem to accept their lot as a subject people. Um, but at the same, but it's these same Europeans who are, you know, they're kind of foisting a model on the Greeks at the time, which is based on a complete misunderstanding of how the Ottoman Empire works. But it's actually the Western Europeans who are kind of well, one of the things they're doing is that the idea of the nation is gathering ground in the 18th century in the West. And this is the beginning, it's the roots of nationalism, as we understand it. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, there weren't, there weren't really nation states in the much more, you know, in the sort of post-Rousseau sense that we're familiar with today. So it came quite naturally to people in the 18th century in Europe to describe the ancient Greeks as a nation, mm -hmm. as indeed they described the Jews as a nation. Um, so, who were those people who spoke Greek in the Greek lands in the Ottoman Empire today? Well, they were the descendants of that nation. Um, and that's really where that vocabulary comes from. It's not Greek. It comes from the West. It's the Western emerging idea of the nation. You kind of assume that ancient Greece is a nation, um, which, you know, in modern terms, actually it wasn't. Mm. You know, it, it organized. It was. I mean, I'm sure you've been talking about this in your previous discussions. It, it was something else, but it, you know, it didn't organize itself in that way. Mm -hmm. But in the 18th century, um, you know, Western Europeans thought that it did. Therefore, the Greeks are the descendants, and this vocabulary finds its way into Greek. And it's actually not until the la the latter decades of the 18th century that people writing in writing in Greek begin to refer to themselves not only as Romyi, that is Romans, the descendant of the term that you all have been discussing with Professor Calderis last time, um, but also as Pedes Tonelinon, children of the Hellenes. Mm. Hellenes, of course, being the ancient term in Greek that referred to Greeks. Mm -hmm. A further confusion here is that in all the Western European languages, the same word, Greek, goes sort of right through it, refers to everybody, ancient or modern. Yeah. But you, can't, you couldn't do that in Greek. In Greek in the 18th century, Hellene meant um, someone who wasn't Christian. Mm -hmm. And it specifically culturally meant a pre-Christian pagan ancient Greek. Mm -hmm. um, some of you know, Socrates and Plato and Pericles were all Hellenes or Hellenes. Hellenes um, yeah. But they, you know, they were pagans, they weren't Christians. Mm -hmm. you, couldn't, you couldn't say, you know, I'm a Hellene. Because I'm a Romeos, I'm a Christian, you know, and Romeos means Christian. And I think one of the complexities for the Greek Enlightenment was that these, what actually, what really defined these people's sense of group identity was their religion. And their word for that was Romeos. Romeos, Professor Caldelis, I think, doesn't agree with me on this. But anyway, I think Romeos, by the 18th century, is a purely religious term. But it, but well, I mean, its significance is religious, but it defines a secular community as a by religion. I mean, I don't think people are thinking so much about the Byzantine state anymore, but they're brought together by a religious faith and and practices that they all share. Um, they're not going to give that up. Mm. This is why there's no anti-clericalism. You know, this is what defines them. Mm. But for the same reason. For a long time, you know, it seems it seems you know counterintuitive to make too much of a link to those pagan Hellenes, because in religious terms, you know, the Hellenes are the origin of the Greek language and the education that all Greek speakers at all periods have valued enormously. Yeah. But in in terms of religion, the ancient Hellenes must be just about as you know as different as the Muslims on one side and the Roman Catholics or Protestants on the other. <laughs> these monikers then of self-identification, they're very fluid and the, the meanings of these certain terms changed over time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to remind our viewers that if you want to ask Professor Beaton a question, uh, to please use the comment function on the Facebook live feed. And uh, at the end of our time, uh, we'll be able to uh, ask him some of these. So I want to go then from idea to action. So, yeah. so we're talking about this burgeoning Philhellenism, admiration for rediscovery of interest in 
the Greeks in the ancient world, this change in and a growing sense of trying to um, uh, develop a sense of continuity. But how do we go from these intellectual ideals and ideas to action where once the seeds of revolution uh, are, are are planted, where we where we go from from words to to, to movements. So could you could you talk about that that sort of switch or transition from uh, idea to to action? Yeah, I'll try. I mean, again, you know, it's it, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot going on, and I'm conscious that time is passing, and actually, we're still in the 18th century, and we haven't got to the revolution yet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Philhellenism in the 18th century, I mean, modern Philhellenism, and even the word, it's all about love of ancient Greece and ancient Greek civilization. And it's particularly associated with the German historian of art, um, uh, Johann Joachim Winkelmann. Winkelmann, yeah. And his history of ancient art, published in German in 1764, really establishes for the first time the sort of theory in the, in the visual arts, that the highest <clears throat> the highest point of artistic achievement of humankind was not the Roman Empire, but the ancient Greeks and particularly the Athenians of uh, of the time of the Athenian democracy. And Philhellenism really begins from that. It's 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 this whole process of idealizing a civilization, which I mean, Winckelmann himself, I mean, seemed to think it was, you know, it was almost impious to imagine recreating in the modern world. It was so, you know, sort of up there, way above, you know, any of us, uh, anything that we could possibly achieve ourselves. And of course, the higher the, these Philhellenes, in that sense, elevated the bar for Greek civilization, the less chance any poor old real Greeks at the time had of scraping over it or even coming anywhere near it. I mean, a classic case, um, and this does bring us near the time of action, let's move to 1821, and the Italian city of Pisa. Um, and the exiled, self-exiled English poet Percy Bysshe Shelley is living in Pisa with his wife Mary, who is, was famous as the author of Frankenstein, which is now much more famous than anything that her husband wrote. Um, and while they were there, um, Shelley, and Shelley was, I mean, it was a classic Philhellene in the Winkelmann sense. His Greek, his ancient Greek was probably among the best that anybody had in Europe at the time. And he translated Plato's Symposium, um, and you know he's a, and he's I mean as a poet he's an he's in every sense an idealist. Um, and they're living in uh, they're living in Pisa at the end of eighteen twenty. They meet um, they meet this man at the university um, whose name is Alexander Mavrocordato. They call him Alexandros Mavrocordato. And this is the one. This is the man who will become one of the, the principal intellectual and political leaders of the Greek Revolution, and they um, they get along famously. Um, and the, the men talk about uh, talk about argue about how you pro ought to pronounce ancient Greek, and they don't agree. Um, and <clears throat> Mavrocordatos and Mary Shelley um, set up this pact whereby he he already knows seven languages. She offers to teach him English in return for him teaching her ancient Greek. And so the three of them become quite close. And on the 1st of April, 1821, Mavrocordatus appears in great excitement in their flat along <clears throat> overlooking the, Argo in, uh, the Arno in Pisa. And Mary says in her diary, you know, he's as, as, as Mary is a caged eagle set free, revolution in Greece. And Mavrocordatus brings the news of revolution in Greece, and the Shelleys help translate the declaration and send it to England. Mm. And after that, um, there, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there are some letters um, still extant, they haven't been fully published, from Mavrocordatus to Mary Shelley, where he, you know, he actually is very frank about the news that's coming from Greece, and um, how it, you know, and, and there's Mary Shelley's enthusiasm with, um, and Shelley's too. But Shelley, the poet, doesn't know what to make of this, because, you know, Mavrok of that is a prince, he's well-connected, he's idealistic in his own way, but, you know, he's he's not Shelley's idea of a hero. In mm. fact, he's not anyone's idea of a hero. He, you know, he's a very effective operator, but um, he was, 
you know, he was five foot tall. He wore, he was quite tubby, he had the thick spectacles, um, uh, you know, and a brilliant mind. But, um, and Shelley actually is desperate to write a poem to celebrate what's happening in Greece. But he doesn't know how to do it. And he makes several false starts. And finally, when he does, the poem is called Hellas. He dedicates it to His Excellency Prince Alexander Mavrocordato. But in the poem, he actually, it's a form of an, it's a, 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 an ancient Greek drama modernized for 1821. But Shetty doesn't know what to do with the Greek Revolution. And it is in his drama, he actually has the Greeks defeated so that the ideal of ancient Greece can float ethereally above the ruins of a failed revolution. And when people talk about Shelley's Philhellenism, you know, they don't always tease out the different strands of that. Shelley was so much in love with ancient Greece that he couldn't really get his head round, much as though he wanted to, the reality of a real violent, bloodthirsty revolution on the ground that was actively creating something that wasn't ancient at all, but something that was actually new. So he actually imagined Greece losing, uh, or the Greeks losing in this uprising. That's what happens in his famous poem, Hellas. So how do we go from uh, even this sort of pessimism about what the Greeks on the ground could do to where we have Phil Hellenes taking up arms and joining Greek revolutionaries to, to fight? How, who was going over and, and what, what motivated them to go and fight? Well, I mean, that's the great, I mean, to, for one thing, it's, it builds on the um, European Enlightenment, its offshoots in the United States as well. And particularly, I think, on, you know, an offshoot from that in turn, which is in, in um, monumental architecture, arts and architecture, it's called the Greek Revival. But the whole, you know, the whole process that leads to... Um, you know, buildings all over um, all over Europe and then America and before long even Australia and, you know, the South American continent as well. Um, I mean, your Supreme Court building is the classic example of that. It wasn't built in 1935, but the first the first design for the U.S. Capitol was in part, again, you know, it's a Greek revival design. It's going to be in part a Greek temple. So all over the, you know, sort of civilized, enlightened world, um, people are looking back to ancient in ancient Greece, this is you know Phil Helena is quite well, quite well, um, you know, embedded. This is the time when the Greeks in Greece take up arms um, against the Ottomans. They're fighting for their freedom. Um, no one really quite knows how and why it did, and took the form it did when it did. Um, and from what we can make out of the the aims of those who took fired the first shots or played the leading roles at the very beginning, it's not at all clear that they had much of an idea either. Mm. But in broad terms, they were inspired by the examples of the revolutions in the United States and in France. And they wanted to, you know, they wanted to create liberty in something like the sense that the US Constitution enshrined and several abortive French constitutions of the 1790s also did. And it's worth remembering, by the way, that at the, in 1821, no revolution had ever succeeded in creating a new modern kind of state model founded on the ideas of the Enlightenment in Europe. It was only in the Americas, first the US, then I think Haiti comes probably second, something like 1804, and then the South American republics. But Europe lags behind, and the French Revolution um, I know our French friends um, uh, take a slightly different view, and it is true that France is now um, a very a secular, forward-looking republic. But it, you know, it didn't it didn't succeed in the in its in the first attempt. So the Greeks actually are they're actually the first, and this really take you know it it, it gets going in the spring of 1821, and partly I think just because the Ottoman reprisals are so horrific. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they also, that stops it in, it tra in its tracks in many places, but where the revolution has got a foothold, which is in southern Greece, as now is, and some of the islands, they can't stop it. And there's no, and therefore there's no going back. Mm -hmm. This is the point at which, um, you know, the rest of the world begins to take an interest. We're not talking about governments here. We're talking about individuals. 
And I think it's, again, I think it's very important that right at the very beginning, Prince Alexandros Ypsilandis, who was the first to raise the standard of revolt in what is now in Moldavia, it's now part of Romania, he issued a proclamation on the 24th of February or the 8th of March, depending on the calendar you're using, 1821, in which he, he said that the peoples of Europe had their eyes on Greece and were, and were, you know, were expecting the Greeks to re, um, redeem the sort of glories of battles of Marathon and Salamis in the modern age. A, a month later, Petrombe Mavromichalis in Kalamata, raising the standard of revolt in the Peloponnese, issued um, a rather wonderful, slightly pompous translated, but you know, a rather wonderful document, very much in the style of uh, American and French revolutionary proclamations, um, saying how the you know the Peloponnesians have risen up to cast off the yoke of tyranny and to lay down their lives for liberty. But they call, he calls specifically on the governments of Europe to lend the philanthropy and to lend support and even weapons to fight, to, to help the Greeks fight for their freedom. Mm. And it's terribly important from the Greek point of view that, um, because, you know, I mean, some Greeks didn't, haven't always seen it that way, but right from the beginning, key leaders of that revolution were always looking outside beyond the borders of the state they hoped to create. They were looking for foreigners to take a hand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, the... European governments at that time were absolutely no way going to take a, any notice of this at all, and they absolutely cold-shouldered um, for several years. In the US, I think you may be talking about this in your next uh, your next occasion. But President Monroe um, came quite close to. Um, he seemed to he, he wanted to recognise Greek independence, but he stopped short of doing it, and Congress did too. It was actually so the US didn't recognise Greece either. Um, it was volunteers. Um, who went to Greece, um, took up arms. Uh, in most, uh, many of them came back disillusioned. Uh, uh, easily, a third of them actually died either from uh, either from from battle or from disease. Their tr stories are often tragic. They're often also you know, the heroic stories. But it's quite a small number of people. But the key thing is that these are volunteers who leave their own countries, often against the express wills of the authorities there in order to take up arms in a war which is somebody else's, it's not theirs. They're not doing it because anyone else has told them to. Um, not even, I mean, the Greeks have asked them to come, but you know, they're not sort of being employed by the Greeks. Um, it's a key distinction is they're not mercenaries. Mm -hmm. Doing it for love? These are philhellenes. This is where the, you know, the word takes on a whole new meaning. This is not love of ancient Greek civilization. It's people willing to lay down their lives for the liberty of the Greeks who are fighting for it. Now, the key thing is why. Now, one influential modern explanation for this phenomenon is humanitarian, that actually the beginning of the humanitarian interventionism that probably peaked in the 1990s um, is the 1820s. And that probably applies in the US more than it does in Europe. And I mean, Samuel Gridley Howe is a famous philanthropist. The Swiss um, philhellene um, uh, Jean Gabriel Einar, again, a banker, he gave a lot of money, he organized relief for the victims of atrocities. But fundamentally, I don't believe it was driven by humanity. I mean, you know, humanity is part of it, but it wasn't like President Clinton insisting on intervening in Bosnia, say, um, to stop people killing each other. You know, it was horrific and people wished it wasn't happening. But I think what the, why the Philhellenes went there was that they believed that something of their own was at stake. Um, and I, mean, I mentioned Shelley, and in the preface to Hellas, he says, we are all Greeks. Mm -hmm. The laws, our science, our arts, they all have their origin in Greeks. And he pretty much says, you know, we owe it to the Greeks. Mm -hmm. And that sense of owing it to the Greeks, you know, is not a faraway people fighting for their own freedom in their own corner of the world, but something of our own, you know, we, whoever we are, is at stake. That's why they go to fight. That's why they risk their lives. Mm. The, uh, these these men and, uh, and who who were willing to lay down their lives. Uh, it's it's remarkable to see this kind of change in perception and and the ideals uh, that they're uh, how far they're willing to go um, uh, to see this revolution through and succeed. Um, you, 
you've offered us a very, very uh, rich picture of these changes that have taken place. So what I'd like to do now is in our remaining time is to, to bring some of the questions from the audience and, and I'll try to frame them in a way because I know our time is running short and we could go on for much longer, but. I realize, uh, sorry, sorry, Professor Kim, and just, yeah. just before you do, I mean, sure. if I could just add to what I said about the Philhellenes in action, mm -hmm. I think it's very important. And it's only really been, this has really only been shown by a study published 10 years ago, that far more numerous and far more influential than those high profile volunteers in the front line mm -hmm. were um, much less glamorous, but much more numerous people who got together to form societies, mm -hmm. pressure groups, bring pressure to bear on governments, raise mm -hmm. money on what's been called the home front. And I think, you know, it's uh, very important that Philhellenism has recently been called a movement that swept the whole of Europe. And that, I think, was influential in bringing pressure on, on the governments of Great Britain, France and Russia, which mm -hmm. played a key role in ensuring the outcome of the Greek Revolution, which was the creation of the independent nation state, as the ambassador mentioned at the beginning, first formally recognized in February 1830. Yeah, in fact, that was one of the questions that came from the audience is this idea of Philhellenism on the home front. So there's a there's almost a grassroots sort of organization uh, mm. and, 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 and sort of strength in numbers that enables these uh, pockets of Philhellenes to uh, raise funds, to send supplies, to pressure their governments to, to be involved. And, and, and that's a, it gives us a picture that, that the interest in Greece and its destiny uh, was certainly uh, thought about deeply within uh, the community, the Greek community under the, the Ottomans, but also beyond, well beyond, mm -hmm. uh, and, and even across the Atlantic. And that's a really important uh, point to keep in mind. Um, there's a question here about the more practical things about the revolution of, um, and the fall of Mesolongi as a sort of turning point. Because you, you mentioned that the great powers generally uh, cold shouldered this revolution. Yeah. Uh, what would you say turned the tide where Greek uh, or, or where where these uh, European countries uh, changed their minds and and decided that that uh, the the revolution was something that needed to be successful? Yeah, I mean it was it was a combination of things. I mean, one I think was the um, a very smart diplomatic thinking by a number of the great leaders. And again, I would single out Alexis Mavrokosatos, whom I mentioned before. I mean, he was the one, <coughs> excuse me, who first in the summer of 1823 wrote a series of letters to the British Foreign Secretary George Canning, um, making the very the very canny, cunning political argument that if the Ottoman Empire is on its last legs, the British and French really need to support a strong and independent Greece, otherwise Russia is going to expand and take over the whole of the Balkans and the Eastern Mediterranean. And it was actually that, you know, it's that sort of really rather cunning stirring the pot of great power rivalry mm. that actually forced each of these three great, great powers to combine, com to join forces, paradoxically, precisely in order to prevent any one of them gaining the advantage from Greek independence. But, you know, the, the, the tipping point, and your question is quite right, I think the fall of Missolonghi in April 1826 is part of, is perhaps a key, a, a key event there. But it's that after that tipping point, the great powers realise that they can't cold shoulder this anymore. They can't... Um, they can't let the Greek Revolution go under. And by 1826, things are looking very grim in Greece indeed, because the, the empire really is striking back. Yeah. Um, but they can't let it go under. But equally, they can't, um, because they can't afford to let any their rivals gain an advantage, they have to intervene jointly. And that's the catalyst that makes possible the Battle of Navarino, mm -hmm. which the, the joint naval task force of Great Britain, France and Russia, um, wipe out the combined Ottoman and Egyptian fleet. And after that, um, I mean, the British, the, the British command at Navarino, the French after that land, uh, a land force which mops up the last of the Ottoman garrisons in the Peloponnese. And these are not Philhellenes, these are French forces sent by France, I mean, to fight alongside the Greeks, but 
um, this is great, the great power is taking a hand, that sort of, that really puts an end to Ottoman resistance in southern Greece. And then in 1828, Russia goes to war with the Ottoman Empire, as, you know, many Greeks had been trying to encourage them to do all along, and they'd always refused to. And in 1829, the Russians get as far as Adrianople, Adrianople, 100 miles from Constantinople, and uh, when peace, you know, the peace that's uh, established in September 1829, that's really what paves the way for um, is the uh, the British and French really then put pressure on the Russians? Well, okay, we're good, but you know we, we're going to we've got to have the Greek, Greeks independent because they don't want the Russians moving in, basically. <laughs> so they bring the muscle, uh, but uh, certainly kind of, to help the Greeks, yeah. uh, but also as a buffer against uh, the the rising influence of Russia, and that's a, a major concern. Yeah. Um, well, Professor Beaton. Um, I, you know, I think of you and, and myself as embodying philhellenism. I mean, we we in our own ways uh, have studied and and have written about and have spoken about uh, our love for Greece and and its history and its culture and its language. And uh, it really is a privilege to have you share with us uh, your knowledge, and, and I'm grateful for that. Um, and uh, I hope that our audience has also gained from the insights that you've provided. And, and granted, not everyone's going to agree with the different perspectives you have given us, but uh, I know that they are, of course, rooted in careful examination of text and study and understanding the context. And so that, uh, I, th I think, is a, an important lesson for us in what the valuable work historians do. And so I want to thank you for that. Um, for our next and final part of this series, Phil Hellenism Through the Ages, I will be having a conversation with Professor Maureen um, Connor Santelli, who's written a very interesting book that uh, I would encourage uh, all of our audience members to get. Uh, it's called The Greek Fire, uh, American Ottoman Relations and Democratic Fervor in the Age of Revolutions. And so our focus for our fourth and final conversation, and Professor Beaton has given us some hints at this too, is is uh, what what was American Philhellenism's role uh, in this? And so um, please join us uh, for that conversation. Announcements will go up on um, the Facebook page of the Hellenic American Leadership Council. And so uh, once again, Professor Beaton, I want to say thank you for your time. Uh, and uh, um, we're very grateful, and, and I wish you uh, a good rest of the uh, Sunday, well, I guess it's Sunday evening for you now, so um, uh, but thank you very much for your time. It is still Sunday evening here in the UK, yes, thank you, and thank you for your kind words. I've greatly enjoyed it, and um, I'm sorry, perhaps we didn't have time for more uh, discussion with the uh, with the audience. Um, yep. Perhaps you could, I mean, if you'd like to, if you could forward questions to me by email, I might be able to answer some. But uh, and I do think it's very important to engage with an uh, with an audience, and I hope people who who um, perhaps have a different view of these things will um, yeah. indeed say appreciate that uh, where it comes from, and it is certainly motivated by a deep love of Greeks and all things Greek. So thank you very much. All right. <laughs>